Well, hey, good morning and welcome to church. Hey, if we haven't met before, my name is Zach and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Mount Pleasant. And man, we're so glad you're here, especially if it's one of your first times here. We are so glad that you've chosen to be here this morning. We're gonna open our service this morning, which is a time of music to start to point our hearts towards God, to get ready to hear from God's word later. So if you will, let's stay and let's sing. We we'll start to set our eyes toward heaven. We'll take a step towards God. Strangers, neighbors, a blood is one. Children, generations of every nation, the kingdom comes. Sing this out, don't let, don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where I am comes from. Hey! Swing wide, all you have it.
we're gonna sing one more song together before we go into the next part of our service. And like, man, can I just encourage you to let this be a, a moment to just set your eyes on heaven, to put your mind on things above and not on things below. Let's use this as we sing. There was a moment when the lights went out When death declaimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history
praise you. Yeah, we give him praise. God, that you are holy, that you are set apart, that your ways are higher than our ways, that your goodness goes beyond all understanding. So Lord, we love you and we thank you. Amen, amen. Hey, you can be seated this time. I remember the very first funeral I went to as a kid. It was somebody I had actually never met. It was a distant family relative. And I remember it being a dark, small funeral home in downtown St. Louis. And I looked around and I remember there was sadness. There was this, this sorrow that was there, but I didn't really understand because I was too young to really understand what death really meant. Well, if you fast forward a couple years, I went to another funeral for somebody very, very close and dear to me, and that was a different experience. Because in that funeral and in that moment, I knew exactly what death was. I knew that it was the end of a relationship that I had had, and there was deep sorrow, and there was deep grief. In the Gospel of John, chapter 11, Jesus is around a very similar situation at the death of Lazarus, and Mary and Martha are deeply grieving the death of their brother, and Jesus as well. And although Jesus would ultimately go on to physically raise him from the dead, in the midst of that chapter, he says a few words that transcend physical life and physical death. In verse 25, he says this, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now what Jesus was saying was, he was pointing to the death of sin. He was pointing to a new life and a new, rep, new relationship and a new eternity far beyond the life that we live. Now that second funeral that I was telling you about, that was actually for my father, and it was tragic, and it was a lot of grief and emotion, but there was also celebration. There was also joy because he had received his eternal reward. He had received that new life for all of eternity. You know, each week when we get together for communion, we have an opportunity to celebrate that new life through Jesus. And in just a few moments after I pray, I'm gonna invite you to partake in communion with us. So as you take that cracker, which represents his body, and the juice, which represents his blood, remember that new life, that new gift, that new relationship. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for the privilege it is to be here today. We thank you for your love. We thank you for all that you have done for us. Right now, we just pause and we celebrate Jesus. We celebrate new life that we can have in you. Because you loved us so much, you sent Jesus to pay the price for our sin that we can fellowship and be with you for all of eternity and you can change our forever. Thank you for Jesus. We love you and we celebrate him. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, hello there, friends. If I've never had a chance to meet you, my name is Chris Franklin. I have the privilege to serve as our next-gen pastor here at Mount Pleasant Christian Church. As we continue in our worship, we're going to have the opportunity to give of our tithes and of our offerings. And it truly is a time of worship. Because of the generosity of this church, lives are changed each and every week in this community and all around the world. I have a front row seat to lives that are changed for the next generation because of your generosity. If you came prepared to give today, there's a few ways that you can do that. You can give by texting, you can go to our website and you can give online, or you can also give on your way when you leave. There's giving boxes and collection boxes at the exit of every door in our building. If you were with us last week, you probably heard Pastor Sean talk about what we are going to be doing as a church for the month of October. We're gonna funnel all of our change for a dollar funds towards hurricane relief and the tragedy that's happening in our country that happened over the last few weeks of many lives that were changed and our hearts continue to break for them as they continue to recover. And so we are not just a church that stands idly by. We wanna step up and do something for those communities. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna funnel our change for a dollar funds to an organization called IDES and that's the International Disaster Emergency Services and they have their boots on the ground. They are there and they know what is best needed for those communities. They're in Elizabethton, Tennessee, and they're in Live Oak, Florida, and they know what those communities need. If you wanna help personally, there's a couple ways you can do that. Obviously, one of the ways is you can give to change for a dollar, and you can give to the offering. There's a box right out there that the money will go directly to IDES. Another way you can help is you can step up and volunteer with them in those communities. We have information on how to do that on our website. So right now, I'm going to invite us as a church, if we would just come before these families, and I know that around this room, we know someone impacted in a very real and tangible way. So I'm just going to invite us as a church just for a few moments to pray for those communities, pray for them, and pray for the, uh, the lives that have been affected. And uh, let's go to the Father now in prayer. Father God. We thank you for the opportunities that you give us and the ways that you love us and the ways that you show us and the ways that you bless us. Father, our hearts are grieving. Our hearts are broken for so many families around the country whose lives have been changed, whose homes are gone, whose property is gone, people who have lost lives, lost loved ones, lost so much that they have built so much around them. Put the right people in their path. Put individuals and churches and, and, and people in their way to show the love of Jesus to these communities. Just we ask for, for you to do miraculous things in this moment. Our hearts break for them. We love them. We love so many. We have so many different people who are affected by this. We're thankful. I'm so thankful we have a church right here in central Indiana that can make a difference all around the country because of the generosity of people who love you. And we are so grateful for that. Father, we ask you to move in mighty and amazing ways all over the country and all over the world. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the honor and glory, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's celebrate the chance to give right now. As we do that, I want to direct your attention to the screens for some important updates and some ways that you and us as a church can get connected. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. My name is Brian and I want to welcome you to Mount Pleasant. You could have chosen many different ways to spend your weekend and yet you chose to worship with us and we're really glad that you did. If you're new here, we'd love to give you a special welcome. We want to meet you and answer any questions that you might have. You might be asking yourself, uh, how can I do that? But here's what you can do. You can grab the sermon notes that you got when you walked in. You can flip that over to the back side and scan the QR code. Once you do that, you can fill out a connection card, submit a prayer request, give online, sign up for an event. You can even access the sermon notes for this weekend. If you're with us in person and you wanna to talk to and meet someone face to face, you can also take a next step by visiting us at Guest Connections after the service. Once you walk out of the worship center after the service, it'll be on the right of the main lobby area. We've got some great leaders that are ready and waiting to meet you and to give you more information about Mount Pleasant and how you can be connected.
We desire to be a church that helps you dive deeper into your faith. One of the ways we do this is through faith formation. Pastor Fred Meadows will be teaching a class on the new heavens and the new earth, starting Sunday, October 27th at 9 a.m. This six-week class will cover what scripture teaches, exploring the restoration of all things at the end of this age, and the joy that we all as followers of Christ can look forward to with great anticipation. The class will cover the rule and reign of Jesus, the resurrection of the body, and the eternity in the kingdom of God. Guys, please do not forget about our men's breakfast happening on Saturday, October 26th. Join with other men as we gather to share breakfast. Yes, there will be tons of bacon, but we'll have a time of worship and we'll hear from the word of God. And fathers, bring your sons as men of all ages are welcome to attend. One of the ways that we desire to influence and impact our community is through our Impact Center. This month, we're collecting diapers for the item of the month. You can drop off your donation at the Impact Center, in the Commons at Mount Pleasant, in the lobby of the CLC, or any of our Impact campuses. Now let's get out our Bibles and focus on the message from Pastor Sean Kelly as we continue in our series, Encounter. Mount Pleasant. Come on, let's get it. Yeah. So glad you're here. If you're a first time guest, I want to welcome you. If you're joining us online, I want to say welcome. It is amazing how the internet has completely changed the game, right? Of learning about Jesus and being a follower and connecting to a place when you're out of town. So again, we're so glad that you're here. Um, We have been in this series titled Encounter. Uh, meeting Jesus changes everything. And John is the writer, what we've been looking at is his gospel. He's the writer of this gospel. John is a disciple of Jesus. He is a, uh, he, he's got a firsthand glimpse and, and, and bird's eye view of everything that Jesus is doing, what he's teaching, the miracles he's performing. And John, in essence, writes all of this down because he wants his readers to have the same encounter that he had. Okay, maybe they couldn't have a firsthand encounter, but he absolutely wanted them to know what he saw and what he witnessed with his own eyes. And at this point in our series, we're a good ways through. Um, we're in chapters 15 through 17. Jesus gives his largest teaching ever found in the Gospels. Okay, and it's at the end of his life. He's just finished up the. Uh, he's just finished up a meal with his disciples in the upper room, and uh, he is heading to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's getting ready to die. We talked a little bit about this last week. And right in this moment, in John chapter 17, which is what we're gonna look at, is a prayer in this teaching that Jesus gives to his disciples, okay? So he's praying to God. It's super important to understand as we're reading this. He's praying to God for his disciples. And hopefully out of this, we will glean some things that uh, we need to learn as we are growing as followers of Jesus. Because Jesus realizes there's gonna be challenges that these guys are gonna face. He realizes that there's going to be a lot of trouble come their way, and he wants to to sort of solidify everything that is important in this moment, and he does in this prayer. If you would follow along with me, in John chapter 17, um, we are going to jump to verse 11. He says, now I am departing from the world, and they are staying in this world. But I am coming to you. Again, Jesus is talking to God. I'm coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. And then in verse 12, he says, now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as what? Just as we are. You guys need to wake up a little bit, all right? There's gonna be some interaction this morning. Just as we are, okay? You need to be united just as we are united. And he's kind of driving something home. Jesus is asking God to protect them because of the difficulties that they're gonna face, not only in the coming days, but in the coming months and years. And then he asks the question, he says, God, unite us, okay, unite them like we are united. Now, Jesus already knows what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen in the next couple of hours. They're gonna scatter, okay? They're gonna run, they're gonna hide, they're gonna get away because of what happens to Jesus on the cross. But imagine what that would be like if they were united like Jesus and God were. 
Well, if you jump down to verse 14, he says, I have given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, okay? So I'm not asking you at all to do that. What I am asking is to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth and teach them your word, which is what? which is truth, okay? It's truth. He knows that. He's driving that home to them. Then he, then he says, just as you sent me into this world, I am sending them into the world and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. See, we're not of this world. Now, we're in the world, right? We live in this world. It's broken. It's fallen. However, we, um, we, we, we're not made for this world, but we have to deal with the nitty gritty and the dirty and the ugly of a broken, fallen world. And the truth is, um, Jesus is trying to give the disciples some encouragement of how to deal with this sort of messed up vortex that they're about to enter into. Now, here's the crazy part. You ready for this? All of us are broken and fallen and messed up. So it complicates things a little bit, right? We're not Jesus. We don't have it all together. Jesus knew his disciples weren't gonna have it all together. We are all followers of Jesus trying to figure out how to be better followers of Jesus, yet we still deal with all of the brokenness of our world. But here's the deal. Jesus wants to use us to bring honor and glory to his kingdom. And the prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples in John 17 is is most certainly done in the most challenging days, not only of Jesus' life, but also his disciples. And and for us, it's an encouragement and sort of a guide or a, a, a direction on how to live our lives and the things that we should be focused on in the world that's messed up as much as our world is messed up. Can we all agree our world's messed up? Okay, we're all, we're all in agreement there, that's good. Well, this morning, I wanna look and give you three principles that Jesus prayed out of this prayer that hopefully will encourage us because it was a hope to encourage his disciples to continue on to fight the good fight. And the first is this, to fulfill your purpose. To fulfill your purpose. What, is it, what do I mean when I say to fulfill your purpose? It's our, it's our mission. It's where we've been sent. We've been sent into the world, into the fray, into the battlefield. Each and every one of us have been sent somewhere and each and every one of us has a purpose and it's not an accident. It's not an accident where you live, where you work, where you play, the people that are interacting with you, I believe that wholeheartedly to my absolute core that it is not an accident that God has you where he has you and he has you there for a greater purpose than just to get a paycheck or just to get better at pickleball or whatever it is that you're doing, right? He has a plan and a purpose, If you jump back to verse 17, or verse 18 of John 17, it says, just as you sent me into the world, I am what? Sending them into the world. He sent every one of us. See, after his resurrection, Jesus would say something very similar in John chapter 20. He would say these words in John chapter 20, verse 21. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I too am sending you. I'm sending you out. So why is he sending us? Why do, we, why do we live our life? What is our purpose? What is the point of all of this? It's to glorify the name of Jesus. It's to preach the gospel. It's to shine a light in dark places. It's to proclaim God's freedom. It's to care for the widows and the orphans and the poorest of the poor. In short, to leave the world better than we found it. So our purpose is clear. We're to let the world know that Jesus is the answer to all of our problems. You ready for this? Here's what Jesus didn't want. Jesus didn't want us focusing on politics. Uh Uh-oh, he said it. He didn't want us focusing on social issues. He didn't want us focusing on uh, on cultural wars. He didn't want us to focus on how we should vote or where we should shop or what company we should boycott. He was more interested in people experiencing life change because of an encounter that they had with the risen savior that their life could be radically transformed. And sadly in our culture, the church has, has oftentimes made the mistake of, of, just, uh, of just preaching for people, to accept family values into their heart or to get people into a certain political party or believe a certain agenda. And hear me, I know political convictions are good. I have some, I'm sure you do as well. Family values are certainly important, but the message is way beyond that. And it's much more important than that. Our message, more than anything else, has to be that Jesus has the power to transform lives. 
that your life and my life and the people who do not yet know him's lives can be changed for a greater good. And see, when, when people walk into Mount Pleasant, I want them to know more than anything else that Jesus can change their life. Isn't that the goal? That Jesus can change their life. I want them to hear his name in the songs that we sing and the messages that we preach and the prayers that we pray and the conversations that we have in this room and in the lobby. See, through Jesus Christ, our life has meaning and purpose. We're not just wandering aimlessly, wondering what is this whole thing about? And if we wanna make a difference in people's lives, it begins with us sharing with people the grace and mercy and hope that we have in Jesus. Let me ask you, just for kicks and giggles, how many of you actually know the names of your five closest neighbors? Raise your hand. A lot of you in the room don't. Okay, some of you are like, maybe, right? I think it's Jim, but I'm not 100% for sure. I'm still trying to learn your all's names, so I don't even remotely know my neighbors yet, right? But that's a goal of ours. Why? Because I believe God has put you in a place and, and, and where you live for a purpose, where you work, which leads to the second principle. And the second principle is this, to remember that you have a promise of God's protection. Because if we're gonna reach people who are not yet followers of Jesus, we've gotta be protected in this because there's some crazy stuff happening in our world. In verses 14 and 15, John writes these words, what Jesus said, he says, I have given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Anybody here love to be hated? Okay, he's just kind of cueing you in, like, look, there's gonna be some trouble along the way. Then he says, I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from who? Notice he did not say from other people that differ from you politically, that differ from you socioeconomically, that differ from you in their thought process or their beliefs. He says, I'm asking to protect you from the evil one. The book of Ephesians, Paul says it this way. He says uh, in, in chapter six, verse 12, he says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We're not fighting against other people, but against evil rulers and authorities of an unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. He's saying, look, there's a spiritual battle going on that matters. In other words, on our own, we're hopelessly outmatched. Aren't you glad that you came to church this morning? I'm really building you up, right? Our enemy is bigger. He's more diabolical. He's stronger. He has, he has more weapons than we do on our own. Yet, Jesus makes it clear that it's not the kind of battle that you're to fight on your own that we're to be locked in step with Jesus. It's a promise repeated again and again and again throughout scripture that God will be with us. Okay, if we choose to lock in with him, he'll be with us. Look at at, at Psalms and then uh, then we're gonna look at Isaiah. In Psalm chapter 23, verse four, even when I walk through the darkest of valleys, David writes, I will not be afraid for what? You're close, you're close beside me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me and they comfort me. The book of Isaiah, it says it this way. It says, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. And then he says, the flames will not consume you for I am the Lord your God. You don't have to be worried about what the world thinks. If you're, you're walking in lockstep with Jesus, you're going to be okay because God promises to protect us. And here's what I'm saying. You may feel like the battle is raging uh, around you. And some of you feel that. I've, I've already had conversations where people feel like, oh man, there, there's just no hope left in the world. Well, hear me, Jesus is the hope. And we are the vessel to share that with the rest of the world. So it's not like sit back and go, oh, well, somebody fix it, right? We are the somebodies. Aren't you excited about that? We're God's plan A, and we're not alone. In fact, the apostle Paul reminds us in Romans chapter eight, verse 31, he says, if God is for us, say it loud. If God's for us, who can be against us, right? He's the one that breathed life into us. He's the one that spoke things into existence. However, there's this reality of our everyday lives that we have to face. See, so if you're seeking to please God, Here's where it gets tough. You're gonna have to start making unpopular decisions. There are gonna be people that do not like what you have to say. You're gonna have to accept the possibility 
of not being liked. Being liked is a byproduct of the decisions based on your top priorities. So the question is, where's your top priority in the decisions that you make? Isn't it interesting? Sometimes when you do the right thing, people love you. And then sometimes you do the right thing and people will scream and complain. Anybody ever dealt with that before, right? You're like, you can't win. So you don't let either potential reaction prevent you from honoring God. That's the most important thing. And Jesus is telling you and I, uh, as he prays this promise that God is going to protect us. And it doesn't always make sense and there's gonna be difficult times, but if you stay the course, God's gonna protect you. See, some people don't care what, other people think of them. Anybody like that in the room? Your personality's like, I don't really care, right? My wife says, she's sitting in here, she'll vouch for this. She says, I have two feelings and neither of them get hurt often. Okay, I think at some level it's a gift. I think at some level it's a curse. But every now and again, she does hurt one of my feelings and she'll look at me and go, oh, did I hurt one of your little feelings? (laughs) Yeah, right, There's, there's a glimpse into my life, right? However, what I found, and even somebody that that has this personality, every one of us at some level wants to be liked by people. Now, some people are more people-pleasing than others, and we just have to be aware of it. Because see, oftentimes our self-esteem is wrapped up in what other people think. And if our self-esteem is wrapped up more in what other people think than what we want God to think of us and know what God thinks of us, then what happens is, is we will end up making decisions that don't honor God and honor people. And Jesus is warning the disciples, look, you have to be aware of these things. And he's reminding them that even though it's not the easy thing, and even though sometimes people won't like you, that God is for you and is in his corner. See, we have to constantly remind ourselves that our life is about pleasing God first and foremost. So the question you must answer before you move forward is this, do I want to honor God above everything else in my life? Now that doesn't mean that you're gonna nail it every time, right? doesn't mean that we're always gonna get it right because every one of us are broken and fallen. Every single one of us are in need of God every day. And if the answer is yes, which I hope it is, then sometimes that comes with pushback. Sometimes that makes you an unpopular person. Sometimes you have to make an unpopular decision. Sometimes it might cost you a friendship or a job or it might cost you an opportunity to advance. But Jesus is telling the disciples And he's telling us truthfully that even in those things, God's still there and he's writing a bigger story. And if you trust him, it's gonna work out for the better. So we must get comfortable with the fact that at times you're gonna have to make unpopular decisions. But again, these decisions will honor God above everything else. You might wanna grab your phones and snap a picture of this. This is a prayer I believe we should be praying every single day. And it goes like this. God, protect me from the attack of others. Also protect me from falling to temptation. Please give me your wisdom to navigate any situation that stands in the way of my being a faithful follower of you. Think about that. Any situation, help me navigate. Give me the wisdom that stands in the way of me being a faithful follower of you. See, God promises us a better life, but here's what he doesn't promise. He doesn't promise an easy life. He doesn't promise a pain-free life. He doesn't promise a trouble-free life. He promises a life of fulfillment. And our goal as a believer is to get better every day, to wake up every day and to become a better follower of Jesus than we were yesterday. And it's not always easy. We're gonna miss the mark. We're going to fail, but God is with us. And that's what Jesus wanted his disciples to see. And that's what Jesus was praying for his disciples, which leads to the third and final principle that Jesus prayed. And this is a tough one, right? To be united, to be united. And he's talking to the disciples. He's also talking to the greater church. In verses 20 through 23, Jesus says it this way. He says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Okay, so he's talking to us now, right? He's praying for us. Think about that in that moment, that he's meeting with his disciples right before he goes to the cross, he's praying for us. I pray that they will be, that they will all be one just as you and I are one. And as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Then he says, I have given them the glory that you gave me so they may be one as we are one. Verse 23. I am in them and you are in me. 
May they experience such what? May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. See, Jesus brings his prayer to a close and what he drives home is that they would be united. Let me ask you, in Jesus' prayer, living in 2024, is it being answered? Are we united? Do you see the big C church united? See, as, as human beings, we tend to draw lines. I don't know if you've ever paid attention to this. How many Indiana fans in the room? Right? Come on, raise them. You're, this isn't like, oh, I shouldn't raise my hand in church, right? Now, how many Purdue fans? Okay. I figured a few more screams out of the Purdue fans, right? We draw lines, right? We draw lines. I, I shared a couple of weeks ago back in Ohio, Ohio and Michigan have this incredible rivalry and my next door neighbor grew up in Michigan and, uh, and every Christmas she makes, she makes peanut butter balls dipped in chocolate and that's what she calls them. Now, I grew up in Southern Indiana. My family's all from Kentucky and we all know what a Buckeye is. I've never equated that to the, the Ohio State, right? I can make fun of them I did, and I did in Ohio. Um, the Ohio State, right? What's we that's weird. But uh, can we all agree that Buckeye is a lot easier to say than peanut butter balls dipped in chocolate, right? <laughs> But we draw lines, and legit, she will not say the word Buckeye, and it is so incredibly funny to me. If you grew up in Kentucky or in southern Indiana where I grew up, because I grew up right on the Ohio River, so there's, you're either a Kentucky fan, you're an Indiana fan, or you're a Louisville fan, which I've never figured that one out, right? But we draw lines. We draw lines. We all do. Don't believe me? Let's have a little fun. Democrats or Republicans? Don't raise your hand. Liberals or conservatives? Here's a good one. Homeschool, private school, public school. Right? Can create all kinds of issues. How about vaccinated or unvaccinated? <laughs> I can't even believe that was a thing. Baby boomers versus millennials. Right? Glass versus plastic. My favorite. Cloth diapers or disposable diapers. <laughs> it's a thing. See, we draw lines and we create lines and divisions and sometimes we create lines and divisions and we don't even think about it. And unfortunately, this, this happens in the church as well. Now, I'm gonna share a joke with you. I don't, I don't do jokes well most of the time, but this was rated 44th funniest joke of all time out of GQ magazine, so it has to be good. And it drives my point home. There was a guy walking across the bridge one day and he saw a man standing on the edge of the bridge about to jump. So he runs over and he says, stop, 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 don't do it. And the guy getting ready to jump says, well, why shouldn't I? So the man says, well, you have so much to live for. The other guy says, well, what do I have to live for? And the guy's trying to think quick on his feet and he goes, are you religious? And the guy goes, yes. And then the guy said, well, well me too. And then he says, are you Christian or are you Buddhist? And he said, Christian. And the guy says, well, me too. Are you Catholic or Protestant? And the guy said, well, I'm Protestant. And he goes, oh my gosh, me too. Are you Episcopalian or Baptist? The guy says, well, I'm Baptist. He says, oh my goodness, me too. Are you Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? <laughs> well, I'm Baptist Church of God. The guy goes, me too. Are you original Baptist Church of God or are you reformed Baptist Church of God? He says, well, I'm reformed Baptist Church of God. The guy goes, no way, me too. Are you reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation 1879? <laughs> or are you reformed Baptist Church of Reformation 1915? And he goes, well, I'm Reformed Baptist Church, Reformation 1915. The guy hauls off, shoves him off the bridge, and he says, die, heretic. <laughs> it's as good as it gets. You know, we laugh, but sadly, it's true at some level, isn't it? Unfortunately, the church creates all kinds of lines. And let me ask you, do you think God's bothered by that? I think oftentimes when I see, and listen, I've been a pastor a long time. I've seen a lot of fights in the church, sadly. And it, every time I walk away from witnessing one of them, I just think, man, God, you, you cannot be happy with us. In John chapter 17, verse 23, Jesus says this. He says, may they experience such what? Perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me that the world will know because of our unity that God loves people as much as God loves Jesus. That's Jesus' in essence, his prayer. So why did Jesus pray for unity? It wasn't just because unity is better than disunity. The reason is, 
I wholeheartedly believe is that the world will look to followers of Jesus. And if we are not setting the example, if we are not living this out, then people cannot know and understand what a real relationship with Jesus looks like and what a follower of Jesus looks like. Sadly, the world knows Christians more about what we're against than what we're for. So if you jump back just a couple of chapters, we, we've already looked at this, but in John chapter 13, John writes these words. Again, Jesus said them, your love for one another will prove to the world, will prove to the world that you are my disciple. Your love for each other. See, it's our love and our unity that bring us together. And more and more people will come to know Jesus because of our unity. So the question is, what should we unify around? Should we unify around a political party that advocates Christian values? I mean, is that the core thing that we should be after? Is that the foundation of what Jesus is talking about here? Should we rally around values of tolerance and inclusion? Is that the thing that Jesus is trying to get us to see? So what is it that we should be unified around? Well, I think Jesus answers actually this in John chapter 17. Thank goodness he does, because I don't think it's, it's any more relevant than it is right now. And if you're on social media and if you're watching the news 24 seven, which some of you should just stop doing, if you're having conversations with people, if you're not living under a rock, you know that there's divisions and lines being drawn in our country. And if you go back to John chapter 17, verse three, Jesus says this, and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, the one who sent me to earth. See, sometimes I will be talking with somebody that's new to the church. Now, um, I, I haven't had these experiences here yet. I don't think I've been here long enough. But many times when I was in Ohio, I would have questions and, and people would come to me and they would be like, hey, we're, we're doing a little church shopping. I'm gonna be honest with you, that just makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Church shopping, like that's a thing, okay? And, uh, and they'll begin to, to talk about what they're looking for. And, I, and if they don't, then I'll ask, well, well, what are you looking for in a church? And, and inevitably, somebody will say, well, I want something more traditional, or I want something more contemporary, or I want something a little bit smaller. We were a, a pretty good-sized church. Or um, I, want, I want something maybe a little bit younger than the church that I went to. Or I want something a little bit older. Or I want something that I can get connected with. And what's interesting is I hear a lot of I want, I want, I want. And then I'll simply ask them two very simple but yet profound questions. The first one is this. Do you want a church that believes that Jesus Christ is the way to eternal life? Do you want that? Because believe it or not, there's a lot of churches that don't necessarily want that. So first, of, for, first and foremost, that's the first question you should be asking. Then that leads to the second question. And that question is, do you want a church that believes that the Bible is the authority for life? That that's, the, that that's what we're looking for because ultimately that God is who he says he is and that he gave us his word and it's a guidebook for our lives. See, because everything else besides those two questions honestly is just window dressing. And we draw so many hard lines and we make so many issues out of these things. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with traditions. There's nothing wrong with personal preferences. We all have them. But what happens is oftentimes they get in the way. They get in the way of people getting to Jesus. And often what happens is we would rather have things the way we want them. You ready for this? Than to actually see more people come to Jesus. And we cannot be a church that thinks that way. We cannot be a people of Jesus that is more interested in making sure that the church checks all the boxes and yet we're not seeing people come to Jesus. See, often instead of being humbled by what God is doing and who he's reaching, we're guilty of allowing our hearts to become self-centered. And we're all guilty. We foster resentment over how a church has changed over the years instead of how many more people we can reach. We forgot how grace has radically transformed our lives. And oftentimes what happens is we become entitled to something. And please hear me, that's when things get out of whack. When we no longer see that God can make a difference in somebody's life who is as far from Jesus as we could possibly imagine. And we might just be the thing. This church might just be the thing that brings them into an understanding and relationship of who Jesus is. I have a mentor who is sadly no longer on this earth. His name is Clarence. This is a picture of Clarence. You need to know a couple things about Clarence. 
Um, Clarence was an incredibly wealthy individual. And I tell you that because when he spoke in a room, people listened. He had a lot of political power in the area that we lived. He had a lot of influence in, in, in not only politics, but business. He was a very successful businessman, had several hundred employees, just did a lot of really cool things. So there was a transition at our church. Clarence attended. Um, our senior pastor at the time uh, moved on to another church. Our church was trying to decide who was going to be the next pastor. I was doing a lot of the teaching. There was about a six-month gap there that I, was, uh, that I was preaching and teaching a lot about this, you know, what we're, we're talking about reaching the next generation. And then uh, six months later, they, they announced me as the next senior pastor. Well, that week... Clarence, at the time I knew who he was, but I really didn't know him, okay? Comes to my office, unannounced, does not set up an appointment, walks directly to my office and knocks on my door. And before I could say come in, he walks in my office. He walks over to my desk and Clarence was a, a pretty good sized man and I just remember how big his hands were. Okay, at this point he's in his late 70s, eking into his early 80s and he points at me. Now, this eventually became a term of endearment. At the time, I wasn't sure, but he goes, boy, I need to tell you something. Now, let me explain someone in their young 30s that has an aggressive 79, almost 80-year-old man call you boy. By the way, he can. He's 80 years old. I don't care, right? And I'm like, what is about to happen? Where is this going? I'm not even a week into this job yet, and I've already made somebody mad. Where, what in the world? And then he says some of the most profound words that solidified our relationship forever. He said, I'm gonna be dead in a decade. He said, you need to keep doing what you're doing because we have to reach the next generation. We have to. Can I be honest with you? I'll always be honest with you, by the way. <laughs> Clarence used to set about five rows up it was absolutely the loudest possible place to sit in our worship center. He got blasted by our speakers. And oftentimes he would worship with his hands over his ears. And then he would grab me after the service and he would put both hands on my shoulders. And he would say, keep doing it because we are reaching the next generation for Jesus. That man was one of the biggest supporters of our church and our ministry because he knew it wasn't any longer about him but it was about reaching more people for the glory of Jesus. One of my favorite preachers who is also no longer alive, died here just a couple years ago at age 96, was preaching almost up to the time he died, Ben Merrill, grew, uh, pastored two churches, very successful, grew to several thousand. He said this, he says, I will be willing to put up with things that I don't like for the sake of reaching people for Christ who are not like me. See, that's who we need to be, and that's what we need to be about. See, methods change all the time, and if we're gonna reach the next generation for Jesus, methods are gonna change. Things are gonna be different. It's part of life. I mean, how many of you are using a rotary dial phone? Anybody? A couple of you are? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Not one person raised their hand last night, and they've got you beat by a good decade in age, right? I cannot believe that. Very few people. Do you still have a pager? Just making sure. Here's the thing. Change is part of life. However, I can promise you this. The message of Jesus never changes. Jesus Christ went to a cross to die for our sins so we could be in heaven with him for all of eternity. The message is the same. That we're all in need of grace and in God's mercy. And the church needs to stand as a beacon of light, a beacon of hope. Our job as a church and as Christians is to demonstrate that Jesus is available to all, that we're to be a place that is willing to do whatever is necessary to reach the next generation. And see, here's the thing, something happens if we're not careful in our faith walk. And I think this is so dangerous, but it is so true for so many of us, is I think we forget sometimes the wonder of coming into a relationship with Jesus. We've forgotten how good his grace really is. We've forgotten that we are in need of him each and every day. And we go from on fire to wanting to tell everybody about Jesus to taking it easy 
the settling in, that we're more interested in what we can get from it than what we can give to it. And sometimes, I believe oftentimes, sadly, we're the ones that need the second chance. We're the ones that need the wake-up call. We're the ones that have been approaching this from a wrong perspective. See, we must always remember and never forget this, that we are just a beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. That we're just a beggar. That I am a sinner saved by grace and I need God's grace as much as you do each and every day. And all of a sudden that levels the playing field when we're having conversations with people because we're no longer interested in their political affiliation or whether, they're, or whether they have traditional values or they have whacked out ideas. You see them as God sees them, as his child. We are just sinners saved by grace and we need to reach as many people as possible for the glory of Jesus Christ and to realize that one of great, Satan's greatest tools it's, it is his greatest tool, in my opinion, is to try and divide the church because if he can divide the church, he knows he's gonna win the war. So let's be a church that's undivided, right? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna stand together. We're gonna read one little passage of scripture and we're gonna, we're gonna read it as a declaration, okay, that we are making today as a church. So come on, stand up with me and then we're gonna worship together. It's found in John chapter 17, verse 23. I'm gonna read it but you're gonna say the green part, are you ready? May they experience such Oh, you guys are awake, that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. It is about us being united as a church because if we're united as a church, more and more people in Greenwood, Indiana will come to know Jesus because of the way that we live and that's what this is about, right? Is that what this is about? Okay, fantastic, here we go, let's pray. Father God in heaven, we love you and thank you for the life that you have given us. God, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve your grace, we don't deserve your mercy. But God, the reality is, is we're no better than anybody else. And we wanna be, we want to be the beacons of light that go into the world, that go into Greenwood. We wanna be your vessels, we wanna be your plan A. And God, we wanna celebrate as a church more and more people coming to Jesus because of the way that we simply lived. So God, give us courage because there's gonna be pushback. Help us not to be a people that draw lines, but a people that blur the lines, not because we want to appease people, but more importantly, that we want to reach them for you. God, give us eyes and a heart and ears to see and to know those who are far from you and that we can just simply live in such a way that changes their lives forever. We love you and praise you. In Christ Jesus' name, I pray. And we all said together and united, amen. Amen. We're gonna end our service with a time of singing together. And as we do, I wanna invite our prayer counselors down. If you just have something on your heart or as you're kind of responding and, and thinking through this message, you wanna to talk to someone and pray with someone, we would love to pray with you. We'd love to talk with you. So no matter how you respond this morning, we're gonna to sing together as we close. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity We'll sing this together, there will be a day there will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. See?
Christian, stand beside the heroes of the faith. With one voice, a thousand generations sing worthy. we thank you for your holiness, for your goodness. Again, that your ways are higher than our ways. And because of that, we can rejoice in you and that you can bring us together. So Lord, we love you. And say your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, we actually have the opportunity to celebrate a couple of baptisms to close our, our service this morning. So let's put our attention to the baptistry. Hi, my name is Robin. And this is Avery. I'm one of her small group leaders. And today, Avery is going to be making her public profession of faith and to be baptized. So Avery, will you please repeat after me? I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God, the Son of the Living God, and I confess him, and I confess him as my Lord and Savior, as my Lord and Savior. Avery, upon your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm Brett, and today I get the honor of baptizing my, baptizing my best friend, Manny Ramirez. And a little bit about him was before he gave his life to the Lord, he was, like he said, he was broken and full of sin and knew he had to do what he had to do, and the Lord guided him. So if you would repeat after me this profession of faith, I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I confess Him as my Lord and Savior. And I confess Him as my Lord and Savior. <laughs> Come here, buddy. Easy. I now baptize Easy. you <laughs> in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as loud as we rejoice, heaven rejoices even louder at that. Hey, thank you so much for being with us this morning. If you're new, we'd love to connect with you. We'd love to talk with you at Guest Connections just outside of this room and to the right. So we'll see you there. We'll see you next week. Have a good week.